Hey, and welcome to The Short Stuff, the very special Halloween edition of Short Stuff, Chuck. (laughs) About the Borley Rectory. And I have to say, this one's good, but I think it still doesn't hold the candle to the the one you put together that kicked off our Halloween content, which is the most sterile way of putting it. (laughs) Um, The the two-parter. Of Jack O' Lanterns and oh, Sleepy Hollow. Really? It was like this wonderful. We even got a message from Dave, the producer, saying, like, this is the greatest thing I've ever heard in my life. I'm paraphrasing, but that was basically it. Hmm. Well, thank you, Dave. Yeah. So this is, I like this one too, though, because this is about um, the most haunted house in England. Yeah, which uh, a lot of people automatically know what we're talking about just hearing that phrase, Borley Rectory which a rectory, by the way, is a place where a pastor lives. I believe for the Anglican church, maybe for just Protestantism in general, but, you know, pastors are allowed to marry and they have a family, so you got to put them somewhere. You can't just make them sleep under the pews in the church. So they get their own house, and that's called a rectory. And it just so happened that the one in Borley, which is this little village an hour and a half northeast of London that no one would have ever heard about had it not been for the rectory there, was a very, very haunted place. That's right. And by the way, do you know what we called those uh, in the Baptist church at my church? What? The preacher's house. The sin box? No, we called it uh, that crappy little house next to the church. <laughs> no. That's what they get. It was a great. For dedicating themselves. <laughs> so the rectory was built in the 1880s. Uh, it burned down in the 1930s, but that property itself has a long history of haunting, supposedly, Mm -hmm. uh, going way, way back to the 1360s when there was a monastery there and uh, allegedly a headless monk would roam the fields and a nun uh, would haunt the place who had been walled up uh, alive inside the monastery walls. Yeah, there was another nun, too, that would have come later uh, who was, I guess, who ran away from the nunnery and tried to join the Waldegrave family who owned this property and instead was like strangled and buried in a cellar there. So you got at least three Oof. good ghosts wandering around the site that the Reverend Bull, the first Reverend Bull and his family come along in the 1860s and say, this will be a fine place to build our rectory. And of course, the townspeople were like, this is a really bad idea, but we're just going to sit back and not say a word because, you know, we really could use the, um, the uh, addition to our tax base here at the town. <laughs> and then they thought it through a little further and were like, darn it. Is that true in England, too? I don't know. It's a no, great American joke, though. <laughs> uh, they would hear certain things in the night, like servants' bells ringing, uh, keys flying out of the locks. Mm-hmm. Uh, always a little tinkling of the keyboard with no hands nearby. Mm-hmm. Yeah, phantoms. There was a phantom stagecoach that supposedly used to arrive, and the, the townspeople were like, of course, this is a really haunted site. It makes sense that this house would be haunted, too. Um, and so... The, the rectory itself was built in 1862, and within a year, there were reported sightings. Um, but it wasn't until the 1930s, and over time, like between it, it wasn't like this just started in 1862 and then stopped in the 1930s. Like every family that lived there reported something, some more than others. In some cases, the family there was just clearly afflicted by a terrible poltergeist or horrible ghost activity, just constant stuff. Others were not quite as bad, but um, it was it. every family that lived there reported something. And so f- the house itself got a reputation even before it was known as the most haunted house in England. That's right. Uh, and you know, while this stuff is happening, the old German phrase, mm-hmm. geist is going to geist. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty great. You know? So polter means loud. Isn't that what poltergeist means? Loud oh, ghost? I don't know. Is that what it was? I'm pretty sure. I should know that with my vast German knowledge base, uh, but I don't remember. But I think um, another another translation is Toby Hooper didn't actually direct this. <laughs> <laughs> it's the other oh, translation. Do you think it was Spielberg uh, pulling the strings? Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Don't get me started, Chuck. Uh, so, yeah, the 1930s, I believe in 1929, the Daily Mail sent Harry Price, who was sort of the foremost paranormal investigator of the day. Mm-hmm. Uh, he worked with the Society for um, Psychical Research, and he was like Houdini in that mm-hmm. he was a debunker of mediums, of fraudulent mediums. Uh, but he was also sort of a 
probably a bit of a self-promoter and blow hard. <laughs> and the people at the SPR were like, I don't like you so much. Uh, and he went, well, I don't like you either. I'm going to go find my own jam. And uh, he founded the National Laboratory of, I said physical before, Josh corrected me, <laughs> psychical research. Yeah, it'll trip you up for sure. I was raised on this stuff. Like, I used to want to go to Duke and study parapsychology when I was a kid. Hey, so, you can do that in retirement one day, my friend. Maybe I will one day. I don't think they have that that research anymore. But <laughs> anyway. Um, like so, Mr. Clark, we discontinued that program in 1987. <laughs> <laughs> well, could you start it up again? So Harry Price, he was, because he was such a good self-promoter, he wrote a lot of books. And he wrote his books to be um, easily consumed by the public. Like, they were very readable, I saw. Um, and so he became a very, very well-known debunker of mediums and, and a well-known skeptic. So when he went to inspect Borley Rectory himself at the behest of the Daily Mail, and he came out of there and said, yeah, this actually checks out. This place is a haunted house. People definitely took notice. Like, he lent his credibility to it. And not because he was a fraud or a sham necessarily. Like, he seemed to have really been convinced, at least at first. Maybe always. All right. I think that's a good spot for a break. Okay. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about this rectory right after this. So one interesting thing that happened at the Borley Rectory was it burned down. Uh, this is in 1939. And, you know, if you believe the story, then it seems very suspicious. But the owner at the time, Mr. William Gregson, said that he saw with his own eyeballs a stack of books that were sitting there on a shelf, flew off on their own, and ended up knocking over a lamp, a paraffin wick lamp, and that ended up burning the house down. Yes. And fortunately, that happened after Harry Price had spent the previous year there. So he leased the place in 1937, 1938. That's committed. It, yeah. He went and lived there for a year with 48 assistants that he hired um, so that they could all work basically around the clock studying and recording all the ghostly phenomena that was there. And he made his career like even further. This cemented Harry Price in the annals of parapsychology were his studies on Borley Rectory. And he published two books, um, The Most Haunted House in England, uh, which coined that phrase, I believe. I don't think he used it before then. Um, and, and cemented in everyone's mind, like, yeah, Borley Rectory is proof positive there are haunted houses. And then after the fire, I believe he wrote a second book, a follow-up book called The End of Borley Rectory. And so for years until Price's death and a few years beyond, uh, anybody who believed uh, in the world, basically, in ghosts, had probably heard of Borley Rectory and considered it as, like I was saying, proof that haunted houses can exist uh, because of the work of Harry Price. But then his work was kind of undone later on, right? Yeah, so his old, uh, I don't know about enemies, but it's at least his rivals. Frenemies. Yeah, frenemies at the Society for uh, Psychical Research said, <laughs> you know what, this guy's dead. Uh, he was a bit of a jerk to us, and so let's go undo <laughs> the work that he did. Let's debunk the debunker. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they like they explained they gave alternative explanations rather than ghosts for some of this stuff. But the thing that really kind of like pulled the pulled the wool down or the curtain down on the whole thing was apparently these guys found in Harry Price's unpublished notes. Um, he implicated a woman named Marianne Foister who was the Reverend Foister's wife, who lived there for several years. And she apparently was at the center of carrying out a lot of these ghost hoaxes. And Harry Price knew it, too. So that was a really... Uh, but he buried really, it, right? He definitely buried it. And also the SPR researchers suggested, I don't know where they found this out, but they suggested that Harry Price was also not, um, not shy to do things like throw pebbles in a darkened seance room to just scare people and make noise right. and just kind of add to the whole thing. So the book really kind of cut the legs out from under the idea that Harry Price had discovered a real haunted house. Not entirely. There's plenty of people who still believed, but it definitely put a dent in the whole thing. 
Then there was another book. This one came out in 2000, and this was a memoir by a man named, uh, I don't know if it's Lewis or Louis Mayerling, who said, you know what? I lived at that home a couple of times. I lived with the family of Reverend Henry Bull in the 1910s and 1920s, and then uh, and, and with Bull in the 10s and 20s, then the Foisters, mm-hmm. that Foister, Mrs. Right. Foister, yeah. in the 1930s, and he said, I worked with both of these families, and we did a bunch of these hoaxes. We would tickle the piano strings behind a hole in the wall and stuff like that, mm-hmm. and it was kind of really all us, but here is a twist to that story. A twist? He said he could explain everything save one, that in Easter 1935, mm-hmm. he and the aforementioned Marianne Foister and some other folks attended a seance there and went to an underground cellar about midnight, sat there in the dark, in the quiet, and someone gave a little nervous cough as if they were about to speak. And all of a sudden, all those kitchen bells start clanging together at once, which is supposedly impossible to ring all those things at once. And supposedly no one else was there. Yeah. So Mrs. Foister was there at the time, too. And and, um, Lewis Merling suggests, like, they looked at each other like, what's really going on? These hoaxers were suddenly being hoaxed (laughs) or overcome with ghostly phenomenon. Right. But then, Chuck, there's another twist. That's right. It turns out that the Lewis Mayerling, who wrote this book in 2000, um, was researched himself and found that there was nobody by the name of Lewis Mayerling who was ever recorded living at Borley Rectory, let alone twice. Wow. Yeah, which, I mean, technically could just mean that that book is a work of fiction or whatever, but still, it's a great extra <laughs> twist, don't you think? Sure, I love you a double the, twist. You thought the ghost twist was it, and then bam, 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 there's like the, the anonymous book twist. And then M. Night Shyamalan delivers flowers to the front door or something. <laughs> That's very nice. You got anything else? I got nothing else. Well, everyone, thank you for joining us on this scariest short stuff of the year, the short stuff on Borley Rectory, which is now out. Stuff You Should Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.